Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the virtual chapter for June 2023. Uh, June is busting out all over, and uh, we are busting out to let you know that if you are spending your time watching this video or here with us tonight, that you can get CEUs from IACT, IMDHA, ICBCH, the IHS, and uh, other friendly hypnosis associations that you might be a member of. So be sure and uh, claim your time. We think you deserve to be compensated for uh, putting up with us for an hour and a half, and uh, they will give you credit for that. Um, we ready for the calendar, Karen? Or do you have anything? I think we are. Let's launch into that calendar. Hey, yeah. So July 8th and 9th, uh, the IACT and IMDHA Board Certified Hypnotist Program. Uh, it's a two-day weekend program. You need to be a member of one of those organizations, although you could join by before then if you're not already a member. And you also need to have two years worth of experience uh, in hypnosis before you can be in the board certified program. And what we do is we give you a chance to sort of share with us and with one another what it is that you've learned and, uh, you know, uh, so that we can validate your expertise. But on top of that, we give you some new stuff, new and exciting and cutting edge material to add to what you already have to uh, really give you a uh, uh, metaphorical leg up. And uh, speaking of metaphors, uh, Karen, are you, are you doing a seminar on metaphors at the HypnoThoughts Live? Well, now that you mention it, Michael, yes, I am. And thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> HypnoThoughts Live, I'll be doing a two-day seminar along with Sherry Gilbert. You may know her from IACT, IMDH conferences. Sherry and I are doing a two-day workshop on metaphor magic, the language of the mind. And we'll talk about metaphors that you can use. We all know things like, you know, the Wizard of Oz and how many metaphors can you think of to mine from the Wizard of Oz, right? A gazillion. Unless you work on Zoom internationally and you work with clients on the other side of the pond and they haven't heard of the Wizard of Oz. Not all of them, some of them have, but many countries don't have it. So it becomes an interesting metaphor to try to use if they don't know about clicking your heels together. That's okay. Because the best metaphors are the ones that come from the client anyway. Their words, their metaphors, and we're going to teach you how to elicit and mine their metaphors in the intake process. We'll teach you about writing metaphors and scripting with metaphors, and we're going to teach you some games that you can play with clients, with groups, with kids, so that you can really do some great therapy with the language of the mind using metaphors. That's two days, July 25th and 26th in Vegas after HT Live. And it's going to be action-packed and a really good time. So you can still join us. You can join the conference and then join us afterwards, or you can just do the workshop too, by the way. I'm not sure that they like that to get out, but hey, this is the IACT IMDHA group. So we'll just keep that between us. But yes, you could do just the two-day workshop if those are the only two days that you can get to Vegas about that. I see Dennis uh, chuckling back there because he sometimes knows I talk out of school or uh, <laughs> out of turn. You know, coming up also, we have um, a couple of virtual chapters coming up that one of them is filled, I know of, and one of them is open. So i just like to say this to y'all. If you would like to make a recommendation for somebody you would like to see on the virtual chapter, let us know. We know a lot of people, but we don't know everybody. So if you have somebody that you think deserves uh, a showcase on the virtual chapter, please just drop Michael or me a line and tip us off, and, and we'll try to get that person on here. We find people in lots of incredible places. So, Michael, we did we did that calendar update. Do you have another one after Hypno Thoughts? No, well, actually, I have a hypnosis class coming up in the fall. There you go. Uh, we'll and, and I will mention it. It starts in September. Uh, there's uh, there are three online sessions that are just evening programs, but uh, in between, uh, in spaced in between them, <laughs> there are two four day uh, live weekends in Orlando. So that's starting in September. Oh, excuse me for a second. I'm sorry. Oh, starting in September and ending in December. I've had a hell of a day. I just realized I, I just sat here and was out of breath. Uh, what you don't know, Karen, while you're making that last announcement, I ran to the other end of the house to get a couple of things that, that I wanted to have well, with I me. I think you ran someplace to grab something. I just didn't know how, how far or how long. 
I knew so you could. Have, I knew you could cover me for thirty seconds, but not at high speed. Uh, so, <laughs> so anyway, it, the the class is a it's a certification course, like you know, uh, like always, of course. But it's also uh, designed in such a way that people who maybe have already gotten their training, not just new hypnotists, but budding hypnotists that are just wanting to gain more confidence, can get some more, you know, get some more training, get some more, uh, some more stuff as well. Uh, I'd be, I'm surprised at how many people that have already been certified that have ended up taking my courses uh, in the last, you know, couple of years, because, uh, you know, there's always more out there than you can get from any one teacher. So, uh, so, okay. so there's that. Um, yeah. so oh, in November, yeah. We have Mid-America Hypnosis Conference. And then in November, the National Association of Trans personal hypnotherapists in Virginia Beach. I'll be meeting on November 11th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, I believe. And I'm keynote speaker at the conference. So that's a very mm. cool thing to go down to NAP and uh, Virginia Beach in November. That'll be fun. Yeah. And that's that other weekend in November, besides the 17th through the 19th, when, uh, uh, when the uh, HEA is having their program here in Orlando. By the way, I will point out that no thoughts this year. Uh, as they did their first year, the very first year, as a matter of fact, is uh, having uh, having hypnothoughts on the 21st of July because it is my birthday. And so consequently, a very important day in the history of hypnosis. Uh, and it's just lovely of them to have acknowledged that in that way. So I want to shout out to, uh, you know, Scott Sandlin and the gang at Hypnothoughts for, uh, for that deep consideration. Let me answer a real quick question, by the way, that's in the chat. Where do you get information on the conferences and things like that? You can get the conferences I mentioned at karenhand.com. You can do it karenhand.com slash conferences and cut right to the chase and I'll take you to those conferences. But Michael, uh, yours will be on your website, right? Hip yeah. Florida Hypno, Hypno Florida. No. Well, FL, no, no. FL Hypno. <laughs> FL Hypno at AOL at, at uh, sorry, Outlook. FL Hypno at Outlook.com is my email address. Uh, FL for Florida, Hypno for Hypno, uh, and Outlook for my wonderful, charming Outlook. So uh, FL Hypno at Outlook.com, you can get to me and uh, www.phoenix services. Dot org is my business address that has that information too. So please just get in touch with me and I'll. Uh, I'll be happy to uh, send you information or whatever I can do. Yeah. So I think we, oh, Dennis, do you have a question? And if not, why not? <laughs> he does. <laughs> He's unmuting. There we go. Uh, can you hear me yet? Barely. Okay. Okay. I just have to bump. Okay. Now, I can you hear me now? Barely. I mean, you're low, but very low. And still. Oh my, my, my. Okay. Can you understand me? Yes. Yes. <laughs> we can do that. Well, <laughs> you know, there's a galaxy of the stars coming up, right? And I was going to to subscribe to that. And now I don't know if it's really happening because you didn't announce it. Well, we didn't announce it, as a matter of fact. And there is a galaxy of the stars. Just why just look yes. out your window, uh, at least for those of us on this side of the country. Uh, but there is a galaxy of the stars. It is in September. Uh, oh, my God. Let me see. I can tell you the date right now. August, September 9th and 10th. And uh, yeah, it will be, and you, you should be seeing stuff from IACT and IMDHA shortly uh, about that. I know uh, Linda's ready to start pushing out the promo, but we do have a couple months. So three months, as a matter of fact, from now. So uh, so just around the just around the corner. Thank you for that reminder, Dennis. Yeah, we appreciate that. So there we go. Yeah. So Karen, you yeah. said something a little while ago about um, games. Uh, that you're going to play at your seminar, yeah. at your at your your training at Hypnothoughts, right? Yes, I love this. You know, there was a whole movement, and some people remember it. And uh, our friend David Ruby, you know David Ruby. I do uh, know it. We first connected about this book. I don't know if any of you have seen this by uh, Robert Masters and Gene Houston. This is the original cover. I, it certainly doesn't look like that anymore. Um, well, this one does, but uh, you know, I'm sure it's changed through the years. 
Uh, and and they were the first folks that I know that were doing this, but they were they were creating games for people to explore altered states of consciousness. And there was some really interesting stuff, you know, that was coming out there. And that book, by the way, if you could get a, a group of about 10 people and get everybody a copy of the book and like meet once a week to do some of these things, it would be a spectacular thing to do, I think. Uh, you know, I've, I've always because that's how they did it originally. And I keep thinking, oh, my God, how can you get people together? you know, to do that kind of stuff. But, uh, oh, and I have, uh, so Mind Games. Now here's another book by Hugh Prather called A Book of Games, of course, in Spiritual Play. And this is kind of interesting. This is a little, for, for those of you who have a little more spiritual bent, um, it was of interest to me because uh, some of you have heard my story and you know that I was doing pastoral counseling uh, in the Diocese of Chicago, the Episcopal Diocese of Chicago, in the late 70s, when Jacques de Gawain's book uh, on creative visualization and guided guided imagery started becoming, you know, uh, important stuff in counseling psychology. And so I was doing all these interesting things, these interesting meditations with people. And one day, somebody that was a student of mine, uh, or a client of mine, rather, said, well, Michael, you know, this is actually hypnosis. And I swear to God, it had never occurred to me. I had no idea. Hypnosis just wasn't on my radar, except maybe for uh, uh, Sybil or the uh, the three faces of Eve, you know, but I knew very little about hypnosis or some stage show magic act or something like that. So it was, you know, it was really sort of a thing that led me there. And amongst all those meditations, some of the things that were cool was, uh, as I mentioned, this book uh, was an inspiration to me. Because what I remember about it was that there was a, a meditation, I could sort of find it now, but it really had to do with being a secret agent of blessing. It's kind of an interesting thought. And the idea was, here's your job, here's your mission, should you choose to accept it, you are a secret agent of blessing. And uh, and in this meditation, you sort of gather up the energy, the, 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 the how do I want to say it, a, uh, an energetic ball, if you will, of just blessing. And nobody could see it but you, of course. It was, you know, invisible because it was, you know, uh, it was energy after all. But your job was, as you went through the world during the course of the day, to notice people that could use a little bit of that blessing. And as if you were sort of tossing a snowball at them, uh, to just be able to send a little bit of it out, you know, and then later on find the next person that needs it and the next person that needs it. And you were prohibited to tell anybody that you were doing it, Right or even to make it obvious in any way. And it's just an interesting thing if you think about the idea of carrying this notion of being an agent of blessing in the world as you sort of go through your daily life, it tends to make you a little more sensitive or to, or to sort of looking for the places where you might be able to offer something useful. So I thought that was kind of a cool thing, you know, and I loved introducing people to that. And then I met a man named Stanley Krippner, who some of you might have heard of. So I've got yet one more book to show you, who wrote this book on personal mythology. Uh, Stanley was uh, the uh, chairman of the psychology department at Saybrook Institute in uh, San Francisco and um, and did all kinds of work on personal mythology and these these sorts of things. And one of the things that Stanley proposed as an exercise that I developed into an NLP process was something that I later called the bonsai process. And what it was, was an exploration of your family tree. That is your own, your own personal mythology. That is about how you put the world together, right? Is influenced by, you know, what comes before us just as mythology informs, uh, popular mythology informs civilizations, for instance. So in this particular exercise, you would just stand uh, at one point in a room as though over your shoulder, of course, were your parents, right? And over their shoulders, their parents, and over their shoulders, like a chart that you see of a family tree, right? So you take the position of your own place in the family tree, and there are some questions that you can ask. Um, in fact, you could step back, for example, into the, the, the body and being, the, the place in the family tree of your same-sex parent. And then Krippner suggests that you ask, uh, from that position, what are your major concerns? What are your primary sources of satisfaction? How do you understand your position within your society, its limitations and privileges and responsibilities? 
And if you look to a non-human authority to explain human destiny, what is its nature? And so you can get a room full of people doing this, by the way. It's kind of interesting, right? And they're all sort of stepping back and sort of checking out these answers. Then, you know, you can go back to the next one before them, the next same sex or or the opposite sex or how nowadays, I guess you can do whatever you want, can't you? You know, but exploring uh, exploring the richness of your family tree now, my friend Diane Ross here in Orlando does uh, like past life regressions and sort of new age, you know, new age groups pretty regularly. And something that she was doing was she was having people do past life regressions to find in their past life, in one of their past lives, some particular quality or virtue or skill that they might like to bring with them into this life. And so to go back into that life, by the way, the rest of you, if, if you don't do it, that if you don't think in those kind of terms, think in terms of deep trans identification. So this idea of stepping into some body and being other than the one that you usually occupy and experiencing a particular quality and then considering, you know, finding out, getting comfortable with that and considering what it would mean for you to then bring it back with you. So similarly, I thought the same thing with the family tree. What if I go back there and I find in my great, great, great grandfather some particular quality or skill that I really wanted to have a little bit more? I could go back there. I could hang out in it for a while. And then uh, in using my imagination, of course, and a nice hypnotic process to move myself forward through the family tree to bring it into you know, where we are now. So thinking about this, just the other night, I was asking my, my husband if there was anybody in his life when he was a child that was a hero. And I'm wondering when you think about it now, Karen, do you got anybody in mind when, when I ask you as a child to think about who would be a hero? Um, and it's interesting to notice, I'm, I, while you're thinking, I'm going to give you a minute to consider, because it could be, it's whatever comes to you, you know, I mean, it could be somebody like, you know, your Uncle Melvin, because, you know, whatever he did, or somebody from your school, your town who did something important, but it also could be somebody from television, movies, it could have been, I, I think, actually, the first hero, or maybe the first place that the word hero was ever in my vocabulary, probably was somebody like Superman. So I know that those, you know, that those images certainly, you know, affect all of us. <laughs> but we also know people in our lives, don't we, that are uh, that are heroes already. And so if if there were a story of your life, if you were like creating mythology to describe the way the the world works, um, gosh, who are who are your who are your heroes, and 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 what do you actually consider heroic? Uh, is I think an important question to entertain, you know. And we've only got minutes here, so so you know, uh, I, I appreciate your indulgence with this. But but for all of you, as you think about it, maybe down here in the in the in the chat room, this would be a really good place. If there's somebody that you can think of in your life, and we don't have to know what it means at all, but in your life or or in your your interior life um, that you consider to be a hero, could be a fictional character, like I said as well. Uh, just write write them write it in the message in the in the chat, just the name of the person or something, or or who they were to you. I see they're just uh, they're they're just all going to town, aren't they? <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I can think of a few. Oh, Neil Armstrong, great, Lisa, excellent. Neil Armstrong, Mrs. Boone. I bet you that's a school teacher. Is that a school teacher? Yes. yes. <laughs> Carl Sagan, really good. Your dad, Patty and John, John Kennedy. Kennedy. Um, John Kennedy comes to mind. Yeah. Great. Okay. So, so let me just let's just Lisa, if I can just ask you real quickly. So you put Neil Armstrong, right? Do you mind if I ask you what's the particular quality that makes Neil Armstrong a hero to you? to be brave enough to be the very first person to do something. Oh, good. So to be brave enough to do something that nobody else has ever done before. Yes. Okay, good. So that that particular quality of, of bravery, and and we could say, because we're, we're talking about qualities, but you notice no matter what it is, because some people might just say, oh, that he was kind or somebody 
depending on who their hero is. But while we're talking about qualities, what we re what we recognize is that these are your criteria for hero. You know, we're really talking about what it is that makes this person a hero to you and the particular value that that represents. So uh, so this value, this thing that you value is that willingness to be brave and go forth where no where no astronaut exactly what I was thinking <laughs> where no man has gone before right yeah so so here's what I wonder because we just have a minute to close this loop but if you start meditating on who the heroes are on your life and consider what values it is that they represent for you then I think it becomes a lovely meditation for you to invite the uh, the reference librarian in the back of your mind, if you need a little help, your own unconscious creative mind, to figure out where is it in your own life that you can actually give expression to that particular value that you recognize as heroic in some way. You know, I think one of the uh, one of the things that we're up to in life is to become the best. Ver uh, in fact, I saw this on online somewhere. Somebody said, "Fall in love." with the, the process of becoming the best you that you can be. And I can't help but thinking that the best you that you can be would be the one that actually gives expression to those values that you admire and recognize as you move through the world and see what other people do. Absolutely, that's beautiful. So there, you go. So there is my homily for the day. <laughs> and it was lovely. It well, was you. beautiful, thank you. Yeah, I was going to call it, I, I, I was going to add into the notion that there may be gods, gods, demigods and heroes, uh, because the other way is to do it, to do it the other way. We have created from our values, this idea of what a hero is and, and how to give it expression. But I think sometimes you could look at the the values that are represented by the uh, by the Greek and Roman gods, for instance, or the god of your religion, or whoever it is. And consider, uh, and consider, is that uh, is that a particular uh, being that I would want to be a, a demigod for? That is to to take that to take the qualities of that god figure into expression in the world, or that hero figure, and and put them into expression in the world. But I think you're going to love yourself a whole lot more if what you see in yourself are the behaviors of people and things that you admire. And what a lovely adaptable technique to use with clients for almost any issue, right? That there's something that they want, an attribute that they want, and you can always do that kind of uh, meditation on look, finding the hero who has that, yeah. borrowing their benefits, borrowing benefits. That's a yeah, that's lovely. Great, excellent. So, uh, so thank you for uh, for letting me uh, get that off my chest. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing. That was absolutely beautiful. Great. That was a metaphor, that thing about my chest, by the way. You, you, if you'll notice it, actually, there's nothing there, really. Uh... <laughs> if you'll notice, we speak about six metaphors a minute. And if you want to know more about that, join me at the workshop in Vegas in July. <laughs> Had to get in one last plug. Before we move on, oh, I'm sorry, Michael, you look like you're about to say. Well, I was just going to say, and speaking of off of my chest, that's a part of the body, isn't it, Karen? It is. And have you made friends with your chest and the rest of your body as just far as that goes? <laughs> just call me Chester. <laughs> that, that was my first steady boyfriend, by the way, Chester. Uh, as opposed to Buster, which is different. <laughs> I was just busting out at the time. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, moving right along to the subject of the day, making friends with your body. We are very honored to have Art Emrich join us tonight. Uh, boy, you know, I kind of fell in love with Art, with his mind. In, instead of his body, it was a very platonic thing. At this last IACT IMDHA conference, I just was enraptured with the things he was talking about with the body and all of that. And then I read his bio. Do you know what this guy has done? Art is a certified master practitioner and master trainer of hypnosis and neuro-linguistic programming. He left DuPont you know, that big company, after 30 years as the corporate manager of human development, 
he came to Sarasota, uh, I guess that's in Florida, went to Sarasota from a Chicagoan's point of view, uh, from Can Bay International in Chicago. Ah, he went from here to Florida. Smart move, Art, uh, where he was the U.S. Vice President of Learning and Culture. Art was introduced to the formal study of organizational transformation using hypnosis and NLP in 1980 by instructors in military intelligence at the Pentagon. Wow. His practice now includes the mental game of, of success for competitors, medical referrals for these clients, clients who want to experience peak performance, clients who are experiencing issues of quantity, quality of sleep, habits, negative emotional responses, etc. I hit the, just the tip of the iceberg. He does it all. Art was born in Augusta, Georgia. We won't hold that against him. And he graduated with a BA from the U of Mar uh, University of Maryland, an MBA from the University of South Carolina, and a PhD in behavioral science from California University. He served in the USAF, United States Air Force, in Vietnam. His company is U Solutions LLC. The U stands for unconscious, where all the best solutions are waiting to be discovered. And I had to give you the whole lowdown because have you had time in a lifetime to do all of that stuff, Art? And then how did you go from the Pentagon to hypnosis and NLP? Spill it. Let us know how you got here. Oh, unmute, Mark. Art, you're very welcome to join us, please. But unmute yourself. And this is one of the things we should have checked when we were just talking earlier. There we go. Okay. Now you are Dr. Art Emmerich, everybody. We got it. Yay. Well, these guys um, said, uh, we um, want to use what we're going to teach you um, as a way to build high performance teams very quickly. So what if somebody gave you 20 guys, didn't know each other, and you had a month with them? And at the end of that month, they were going to have to be so bonded to each other that they would give their lives for each other. How would you do that? And I said, I have no idea. And they said, well, we didn't either for a long time. And then we found this process. And it's not the best way to do it. It's the only way to do it. And I found out later after studying with them for quite a long period of time that it was hypnosis and NLP. Uh, but it was an organizational application for high performance team building. It wasn't nothing to do with therapy or, or entertainment or anything like that. So um, I went back and said, well, I'm going to transform DuPont. Uh, and so I was a corporate hypnotist for DuPont. And uh, I didn't tell them or they would have fired me if they'd known what I was doing. But it was a, a wonderful way to um, uh, practice. You know, can I help? DuPont built high performance teams of any unit that I was associated with. Uh, retired after 30 years, went to Chicago, an IT consulting company, uh, 200 people in the company. And um, I hypnotized all 200 of them, literally. Um, went to India to hypnotize most of them. And um, when I left eight years later, we had 7,000 employees in the company. Um, went public on NASDAQ. And so I'm here to tell you that this stuff works in an organizational setting. And I decided at that point, I'm tired of working with groups. I want to get one person because I have no idea whether the people that I'm teaching are actually use this after I leave, you know, do they just forget and go right back to what they're doing. And I wanted to have a, an in-depth uh, longer length of time to work with somebody and see whether this was really working or not. So that's what I've been doing since uh, I came uh, to uh, Sarasota in 2005. So um, the way I um, uh, started talking about this um, when Karen was there is that I um, I used to do a lot of weight loss uh, work uh, trained by um, Robert Otto, of course, who made a, a lifetime of that. And um, I, I found out that I didn't care for it that much. Um, so I developed a technique that drove away most of my potential clients. And I said, um, 
if you want to work with me, I am going to require some prerequisites uh, first. So I don't work with diets and weight and all that stuff. You can get that off the internet for free. But what I would like to work with is your size and shape. So you know what size clothes you'd like to wear and you know what kind of body shape you'd like to have. So that's your goal. You just get that in your mind, whatever that is. And then um, I'm going to give you a four word question to ask yourself before you put a single anything into your mouth. Forkful, um, spoonful, whatever it might be. And the question is toward or away from. So that's, you've got your goal of your size and shape. Is this mouthful that you're getting ready to put in, is that taking you toward your goal or is it taking you away from your goal? Now you can fail on this program, but you're going to fail because there's no more sitting on the couch and watching a TV program and look down and say, oh my gosh, I ate a whole bowl of popcorn or, or a whole bowl of potato chips or whatever it might be. You're, you're going to have to do it. Every bite, you got to say, is this taking me where I want to go or is it taking me some other place? And um, a lot of people didn't think that would be fun to do, so they, they kind of dropped out then. The second thing I had them do is I said, I want you to get a full-length mirror twice a day, take off all your clothes and stand in front of that mirror and look at your full body and front view and say, I love you exactly the way you are right now. And then turn to the side, do the same thing, then turn to the back and then the other side and then back to the front again. And I don't want you just to mouth these words. I want you to feel the feeling wherever you love from. Does it come from your liver or your heart or your gizzard or whatever it might be? But, but that's where it comes from, this feeling of love for your current body. And if you can't do that, I can't work with you because if you don't love yourself, it ain't gonna work. And so I fall in love with all of my clients or I refer them to somebody else. I, I, I started off and they said, oh, you're up here and the client's down here and you have this arm's length distance and you don't get too close and they'll never be your friends and all that. I've, I've, I've completely let go of that whole idea um, now. Some of my clients are some of my really close friends and, and I really enjoy that relationship. So um, I said, when when you um, you know when you can do that, then come back and you know there's some other steps to this process, and we'll work on it. Um, and um, most of them don't come back. You know, they said too hard. I don't, I don't want to do that. So so I kind of weeded myself out of the weight loss area all altogether. And um, so I I really um, feel like if you're into behavioral change. I want to know on a zero to 100, look in somebody in the eye and say, how committed are you to be successful with whatever it is you want to achieve? Zero to 100. And if I hear anything other than 100, I say, please come back when you're ready because I'm prepared to give you 100. And if you're going to give me 80 or 60 or whatever, then, I, you know, I don't want to work harder at this than you do. So. So let's get lined up. And and um, a lot of people realize the trick and they they say, oh, a hundred, you know, I, I don't know if they're really telling me the truth or not, but at least they gave me the right answer. So um, I, I really um, feel like this getting to be friends with your body is a significant healing modality. And so I, I ask people to um, to do that. Um, and so a question I would have for you all is if you decided that you wanted to become best friends with somebody and you already knew them, you know, to some degree, but now you want to be the very best friend with them, what would you do? How would you do that? Uh, and just feel free to sing out, whatever. Talk nicely to them. Talk nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? Go ahead. And ask them. Sorry. Ask them what they're interested in. 
Okay, yeah, to ask some questions um, and find out about more about them. Buy them stuff. Buy them stuff. Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> you got. You got a. We got a a a, 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 a consumer society here that's prepared to help you with that too. Yeah. Well, non threatening. Pardon. Say it again, Dennis. Uh, it was non-threatening. Non okay, you would be non-threatening in your in your relationships with them, right? Uh, not not try to intimidate them at all. Mm -hmm. Alfred. Yeah, that that was uh, that was me saying non-threatening, not oh, non-threatening. Okay. Than that. I'm sorry, I thought that was Dennis. Did you two copy off each other? <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. I yes. I said, listen to them. Listen. Oh, I'm to listen to them. Absolutely, listen to them. Sure. And they've got things to say that um, that you probably ought to know about. Sure. Okay, so so that's just some of the things that you would that you would do um, if you wanted to be best friends with somebody. What would that look like if you were doing that with your body? Is that are any of those uh, impossible or unlikely or uh, anything with your own body? Probably be the same. Yes, Renee, Renee. go ahead. Um, I started a bit of to put Renee, go I ahead. To, okay, I started to put this into practice a little bit, Art, because I heard this. Um, at the expo, at the expo. Um, I started off by just introducing myself and right. asking what their name was and what they would like to be called. Uh, her name okay. is Rosemary. What the hell? But that's right. her name. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, um, it, it, it what I'm hearing has a whole lot to do with communication. You you got to communicate, and and so I don't know how many of you have an active communication going on um, with your body, but I highly recommend it. And I'm, I'll just give you a little story about something that was meaningful to me. I um I went to see my former um, general practitioner, who who I fired on the spot after this happened. Um, when I walked up to the desk, uh, the woman behind the desk, not his nurse, but just, a, you know, the person taking uh, uh, input, handed me a letter. And I, I opened it up and it said, you have kidney failure. Please make an appointment with this doctor that he named. And I thought, well, you turkey, you didn't even want to tell me to my face. You just hand me a, a, a get somebody else to hand me a letter. And I, so, but I did make an appointment with, it turns out to be one of the best doctors I'll probably ever have in, in my life. He was a nephrologist and I went to see him and um, he looked at my lab work and he said, oh, these doctors, he said, I wish they'd quit saying that you've got kidney failure. Everybody's got kidney failure. Your kidneys start failing the day you're born. And, and what you hope is that you'll die before they fail too badly and you don't have to get on, on dialysis. Um, but, but he said, uh, you know, this is just, uh, my job is to keep you out of dialysis. And, and so I have to tell you that I can't improve your kidney function. I can slow down or hopefully stop its degradation, but that's just what we're dealing with here. And so, um, I said, well, I don't understand the kidneys. Well, tell me, tell me how they work. And so it's well, we've got two of them, you know, and they got these little tiny nephron units. These are filters, and uh, high blood pressure is really their enemy because it smacks into them and it'll just knock them right out of the kidneys and and destroy them, um, you know, they'll overload them. And so, got to get this blood pressure way under control. And um, so, cause you're not gonna make any more of them. So that's the, that's the sad thing. And, and so we got to protect what you got. So he's describing this whole thing. And he said, um, I know a whole lot about this because I started off to be a chemical engineer, uh, freshman, and sophomore year. And I worked in summer jobs. And at the end of the sophomore year, I said, if this is what engineers do, 
I'm going to medical school. I, this is horrible. I don't want to do this. And so he said, they're taking us through the heart and the lungs and the kidneys. And when they got to the kidneys, I said, wow, this is a water filtration plant. I understand <laughs> that from engineering. I can do. And he said, I decided right then that was going to be my profession in, in medicine. And he said, I'm, I've loved every bit of it. And he said, but most of my uh, patients don't ask me that many detailed questions about why do you want to know? And I said, well, I'm a medical hypnotist and um, I'm planning on having a, a, a conversation with my kidneys. And he said, oh, is that right? Well, okay. Uh, it's all right if you want to do that. And uh, uh, so um, I uh, went home and that night and got into a nice uh, trance state. And I said, uh, um, I would like to have a conversation with you, but um, I, don't, I don't actually know what, what do I call you, left kidney, right kidney? And they said, no, no, man, you can switch sides. We work just as well. Um, is it arts kidneys? And they said, no, I can take us out of you, put in somebody else. And we work fine that way too. So just kidneys, that's all. Okay. So um, before we start then, is there anything you'd like to ask me about or, or uh, tell me? And they said, yeah. How come we... And you never said a damn word to us about anything. And we screw up one time. Now we got to have this little talk, you know. And I said, ooh, I think I'm getting a performance review and I'm not doing very well. And they said, that's right. That's the truth. And I said, okay, I commit that I will congratulate you and thank you um, frequently for the rest of my life now for the work that you're doing. And, I, and the problem is I can't feel it. I don't, I don't know that you're doing it because I, I don't have any sensation of it. And he said, well, um, we, uh, we could do that. And I said, just so you'll know, um, there's a theory that we operate on that deep in my unconscious, there is a book of me in perfect health. And every page has got a picture of an organ or a, or a cell or whatever, and, and you could go there. Maybe you could find out maybe something you didn't know, and, and I'll check with you tomorrow and find out if, if you found it and if there's anything useful. I said, oh, no, we, we just got back. We, we went there right away. Yeah, that was fabulous. We didn't know about a lot of that stuff. So we'll use that from now on. And I said, well, the doctor said that you're not making any more nephrons, so I, I got to uh, ask you to, you know, get peak performance out of the ones that I have left. And they said, and who told you this? And I said, my, my kidney specialist. And they said, you go tell him he's wrong. And I said, you want me to tell the doctor he's wrong? He said, yeah, we make new nephrons every day. Um, so just let him know about that. But, but anyway, we'll, and I said, well, could you kick up the production because um, my scores are not doing well on the lab test? Oh yeah, yeah, we'll we'll kick it up in high gear. You know, you'll you'll be fine. So um, three weeks later, I I, I get a, another a blood test and and all the uh, lab stuff, and I take it in. And he said, "Oh, here's that guy that talks to his kidneys." And I said, "Don, anybody can do that." I said, "My kidneys talk back to me, though." He said, "Really." Well, what did they say? And I said, "Well, one of the things they said was that you're wrong about this." Um, nephron production, go back and check with your medical school because they're making new nephrons all the time. He said, that's the most stupid thing I ever heard, but I'll do it, you know, just, and and he said, so so they talked back to you. And I said, yeah, they're talking to you too. He said, your kidneys are talking to me. And I said, yeah, look at my lab results. And he looked down, he said, oh my God, I've never seen this before in my life. You're you're improving um, your creatinine score. I, that's just amazing. I, I don't understand how you're doing that. I said, well, please give me the number that you want it to stop at, because if we don't tell them, they'll just go right on down to zero, probably. And I, I need to let them stop in the right place. And so he told me and we got in another discussion. The next time I saw him, he said, I owe you an apology and I owe your kidneys an apology you do make new nephrons. It's the latest study that we've had out of medical school. And your kidneys knew that before I did. And he said, I'm embarrassed. And I'm frankly quite confused about what's going on here. <laughs> but anyway, uh, thanks for letting me know. So this body talk thing got to be part of what I do a lot of now. 
uh, when things are going well or not going well, congratulate your body. Thank your body uh, for all the stuff it's doing. Thank your feet. They're holding up every bit of weight you're putting down on them all day long, every day, and seldom get any kind of appreciation uh, about that at all. So whatever part it, it is. Developed another little uh, wrinkle that you might enjoy as um, what would you think would happen if the King of England were to tell his staff that he was planning in a week to go to some little town in, in England that no royalty had ever visited before? He said, just let them know I'm going to spend the day there. Uh, I'm not going to make any announcements. I'm not there to solve a problem or anything. I'm just going to be there. And I want to go around, I want to go to the pub, I want to, you know, what do they do and how, how's this thing work? What do you think would happen in that week before he got there to that little town? What do you think? Clean it up. Clean it up. It probably never looked that good ever. Yes. Do the same thing with your body. And, and you can do the Queen of Sheba if you're a, a woman or, or whoever you want to pick and, and by all means if you say you're going to go you better go <laughs> don't, don't stand them up um, just go and be there if you got a pain in your shoulder and you've had it for a long time rotator cuff whatever it might be just say hey um shoulder I, i'm going to be visiting you next week and um i just want you to know, and I'm just going to be there. I'm, I'm not there to change anything or fix anything. I'm just going to look around and experience what it's like to be in your area. Mm. What do you think is going to happen in that shoulder area or knee or hip or whatever it might be? It is going to put some healing into that area that you couldn't buy with the biggest budget you've got it we're we're a little chemical factories you know and and uh, we can manufacture lots of things it, it will fix it up to the best of its ability without you having to do a thing it just announced that you're going to be there so so I, I i do these things um through my uh 30 40 years in practicing hypnosis just by imagining and, and personifying things. So I talk to colonies of cancer cells, for example. I talk to uh, cells that are in, involved in all kinds of things, uh, Parkinson's disease, Meniere's disease, whatever. And, and I, I tell them what I want and I ask them to participate. For cancer, I say, look, uh, all your cancer cells gather around I got some information to give you. I, I don't think you know, I don't know why you don't know this, but I don't think you do. And I wanna ask you to do two things, only two. Uh, one of those things is you've got to quit multiplying. We got 50 trillion cells in this human body and it'll tolerate a lot of crap, but it, not an infinite amount. And you can, outproduce and and get to the point where you clog the whole system up so number one stop multiplying all of you got to agree to do this and if you don't you're going to kill the host and then you're going to die and they're going to die and you'll have a pretty short life and it'll be miserable the second thing i want you to do is to keep moving don't ever settle anywhere because if you settle on an organ uh a, a, a a pancreas or a, a liver or a kidney or whatever like that, you will interfere with the operation of that and that may kill the host and then you're gonna die too. So enlightened self-interest, do those two things, you'll both live a much longer, happier coexistence um, than you would otherwise. I've got people in remission now in different, in the United States and in other countries too just from those two things. So again, I personify a cancer cell and say, they got to communicate. What's to say they can't hear me communicating with them and take that information in and either act or not act on it, whatever you know they want to do. So, so allow yourself to be free with your imagination. That's what our hypnosis is all about, is, is our, 
our imagination. Let's 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 imagine something that gives us some uh, some access to parts of us that we need access to in order to to affect some some really what it's not magic. It's magical, but it's not <laughs> magic. It's it's actually using the the actual science the way these things work. Um, to the benefit of, of your clients and and, uh, and and mystifying you in the process, or at least it mystifies me because I didn't know that we could do all this. And Art, I think you brought up yeah. something really beautiful <clears throat> with the metaphors that you created too about yeah. talking about gathering together and let's all get together and this is going to kill you too. We got to all work on this together. That was beautiful. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. I spent 10 years working on my hips. I finally had went to allopathic medicine and got my hips replaced. I had no regrets, but mm -hmm. I spent 10 years trying to change that with my mind. And what I've learned from you, what I've learned from you at IACT, and it really was a light bulb moment for me, and you just repeated it here, was mm -hmm. be careful what you're asking or instructing the parts to do. Because I was asking for... Um, something that would block the pain what i mm. what i knew that i wanted was the hips to regrow cartilage but i didn't actually ask them to do that mm. i constructed other metaphors i put something like a mouth guard in between the bone okay. together and yes that would that would hold off the pain it would soften it would make it easier but it didn't correct anything didn't correct it, yeah. and if i had taken the approach you're talking about I don't know because I didn't know it, but had I taken that approach and really talked to it about regrowing the cartilage, making it more comfortable for everybody, doing something like that, I might have had much more success. Could, could have, I yeah. Think you're really pointing out is be very careful about the metaphors that you're setting up, right? Mm -hmm. And make sure that you're yeah. going at it right. Yeah. Organizational skill that's going to work. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I, I had something happen to an early medical client uh, um, said one day, um, I've been successful at, at clearing up this problem I had. And what I want to know is how come I had to come see you to get my body to do what, what it already knew how to do anyway? How, how come I had to come see you to do it? And I said, you know, I think that's a fabulous question. Uh, your conscious mind obviously doesn't know the answer. Mine doesn't. My unconscious doesn't know the answer, but I bet yours does. So I would like to hypnotize you and ask you that question. And you just answer whatever comes out. I started asking all of my medical clients the same question. And the answers that came back were almost identical. Can you guess what the answer was? I can't even guess the question. Let's start there. Yeah. Easy. Why <laughs> didn't I do what you got me to do? Why didn't I just naturally do that all on my own without coming to a hypnotist? I don't understand why I had to get a hypnotist involved. And I said, oh. I, I think that's a great question. I, I've got it. I've got a, a thought. Maybe maybe it's a hallucination here, but it's what it's what seems to me. There's presupposed in your whole frame uh, era, uh, art is uh, you asked the question earlier uh, about uh, do you want if you wanted to be best friends with your body, or if you wanted to be you know what do you do with somebody you want to be best friends with? Mm -hmm. I think one of the issues is that a whole lot of people when they've got gripes and complaints or they don't like the way that they look or they're overweight or or skinny or whatever that you know whatever it is uh the answer to that question i don't want to be best friends with that body so oh. so here's what i'm hearing you suggest at least is the prerequisite is that you establish rapport the prerequisite yeah. is is that about loving loving your body before the change even happens yeah well, you know, Erickson said your clients probably are your clients because they're out of rapport with themselves. Yes. And and, and a lot of the people I, I, I work with, their conscious mind and their unconscious mind are just having a horrible battle going on. And and I give an example of that with people. I say, I look down, oh, got a little pot developing here. Uh, I think I'm going to give up desserts. 
And that's a good conscious mind activity that analyzed the problem, made a decision, made a choice. And unconscious is sitting back there saying, wait a minute, I love dessert. You didn't ask me anything about that. You didn't, you, you didn't ask my opinion. You didn't, you know. And so if you're going to take something away from me that I like, I want you to know what that feels like. So next day, client meets Joe. Hey, Joe, how are you doing? Joe, what was your last name? Joe Schmuck. Okay, I got it. So the next time I see you, I'll be able to say, hey, Joe, how are you doing? So two or three days later, Joe shows up and the person says, hey, um, good buddy, um, how are you doing? <laughs> and then Joe leaves and the unconscious mind says, that was Joe Schmuck. And the conscious mind says, well, why didn't you tell me while he was here? And he said, because I wanted you to know what it feels like when somebody's got something and they take it away from you. And they didn't ask your opinion about it or anything. And and that's the if you want to do this battle, that's the way it's gonna go. And by the way, I never sleep. If you want to bet who's gonna win this battle, you better bet on me because I don't and so a lot of the clients have this thing going on and they're just fighting with themselves and, and they don't know how to make friends with, with themselves. So yeah. the answer that I started getting back from these clients was, I didn't do it because nobody asked me to. And I thought, wow, is that all we have to do? Is get in a real good rapport with someone and, and ask their body to heal something or to correct some issue? And it will do it because as you know, the unconscious is the mind of the body. It's got 50 trillion cells that it's on a first name basis with. And all those cells need four things. They need food, water, oxygen, and waste removal. So that's four times 50 trillion. That's 200 trillion things that the unconscious has got to be on top of in order to get these cells what they need. And, and, and then let me just read you this list of the systems that it's running in the background. Auditory, cardiovascular, digestive, endocrine, immune, lymphatic, muscular, nervous, proprioceptive, reproductive, respiratory, skeletal, temperature regulation, urinary, visual system, this all going on in the background with no input from us at all because it is the mind of the body and, and it comes pre-programmed on, on how to do all those things to the, to the best of the program that it got about that. Now, a lot of what we're doing is that we're correcting what's happened in the last 20, 30, 40 years where we're throwing insecticides and pesticides and herbicides and every kind of contaminant that you can imagine in the earth and the air and the water. Uh, we've got all these uh, radiations coming in, radio, TV, microwave, all that kind of stuff. And, and this is an evolutionary system. It, it, it didn't know about all that stuff. So sometimes it needs a little reboot. And, and I do something I call a reboot to get the uh, system updated to, to the current situation and, and what it may be dealing with right now. And um, anyway, it's just a fascinating uh, thing to me that um, you, can, you can ask a system to do something um, that um, if somebody says, well, a doctor, for example, oncologist says, so, so what did you, uh, this person's in remission, what did you do? And I said, I, I just told him a story. And he said, you told him a story? <laughs> that doesn't sound very medical. And I said, well, I, 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 I'm a hypnotist. I, I'm a storyteller. That's what I do. I have to learn a little bit. So I have somebody come in. They said, I have uh, acute benign blepharospasms. Can you help me with that? And I said, absolutely, that's one of our sweet spots. So let's make an appointment. And so got an appointment, I called the doctor and I said, doc, I got a whole group of them that I can call on and say, what in the heck is a blepharospasm? And he said, 
Well, that's when your eyes just clamp shut all of a sudden, no warning, and they'll stay shut until either the eye muscles get tired and let go uh, or, or something else we don't even know. And I said, well, what causes that? He said, we don't know. I said, what can you do for it? We don't have anything. Why are they calling you? And I said, I think you just answered your own question. <laughs> All I need to do is, is make up a story. So I, I said, I, I already know all I need to know about this. And he said, you do. So, so what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, well, starting in the brain, uh, the brain knows to lubricate the eyelid by, by close open real quick, close open. But for some reason, we don't know why, Instead of getting to the fork in the road and some of them go to the close their eyes and some of them go to the open their eyes so that they can do both things, you know, they all decide to go down the same pathway, close the eye, and there's nobody left to open it. And so I just say, you you got to make an agreement that you don't do that anymore. you got, when you get to the fork in the road, you got, you got to have some of them going to both ways so that you can get your eyes back open. And he said, okay, and so then what happened? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> Somehow their neurology bought it. It made sense. It's something they could encourage their own system to participate in a, in a problem-solving practice, and, 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 and they did, and that's, that's what happened. So um, I, I guess in a way I'd say play play just let your imagination run and it's not this death serious kind of a thing pretend like i can talk to any part of, of the body i want to i can talk down to the cellular level i can i can talk to any part of the body that i want to and it gets to decide whether it's going to listen to me and whether it's going to respond to me at all but that doesn't keep me from talking i can put my requests in I can ask questions, I can advise, I can give information, I can do all kinds of things and be curious about, so So, what's it like to be, uh, you know, to, you know the, uh, the lining of this person's bladder is being eaten away by the person um, attacking themselves. So all of our cells have a self marker on it. All my cells have got an Art Emmerich marker on them, except the ones that don't. And that's the ones that my immune system goes hunting for. And if it finds one of them, it says, danger, 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 attack, you know, and, the, and all the white cells come in and, and they, they destroy it or, or they do whatever they do. They chemically, um, a lot of times what they do is melt the cell walls on these. Well, well if that system breaks down, which it, obviously does it's because you know back in i think it was world war ii there was a challenge response system where the the front lines got all tangled up there'd be we were on, on their side and they were on our side and if they had um, people who learned english spies that learned english real well they could fool us into thinking they were americans and then then all of a sudden we'd wind up with a with a hand grenade in our foxhole so there was a challenge response system developed. So somebody would say, hey, Americans over here. And uh, so we'd say, New York Yankees. And they were supposed to come back and say, apple pie. If they didn't, we'd throw a hand grenade in their fox <laughs> because they, they, had, they had not learned the system. And I said, probably what's happening right now, and I said, forgive me, body, because I, I can only use five senses. That's all I know about. So you're either going by what the cell looks like, what it sounds like, what it smells like, what it tastes like, or what it feels like. I don't know what you're doing. Maybe you're doing something totally different from that. But whatever it is you're doing, your code has been broken. Add another element to it. So if you've been doing by what, the, what it, uh, I'm looking for the self mark, I don't see it, or I do see it, but it's not, they've stolen it from another piece of protoplasm they got found, you know, loose. So go up and, and lick it or, or sniff it or touch it or something that you're not doing 
and find out whether you can add a second confirmation of validation. Is this really you or, or not? And if you'll do that, I think you'll start finding out, you know, there's a lot of these things that have figured out how to how to fool our system into thinking that, that it's okay and it's really not okay. So again, it, it's playing, it's, it's sort of personifying things. Well, what if I was in that situation and I had to identify and I was not doing it very well? Something wrong with the communication system. I got I to gotta improve it in some way so that it will work better than it's working right now because what, what's going on right now um, is, is not working. So um, if you um, are making friends internally, um, what are some things that you would not do in communicating with your body? Same thing, what would you not do if you wanted to be friends with somebody? What, what would you not do? You wouldn't insult them. Okay, no insults, yeah. No shaming. Is there, yeah, is that the same as negative self-talk? Yeah, mm -hmm. no complaints about what they're doing or not doing, that, that kind of thing. Don't offend them. Sometimes I apologize for not understanding. Absolutely. You would do that to a friend. If your body is one of your best friends, you better do some apologies because we can we can hurt its feelings pretty easily, you know. It's rugged, but it still has feelings and you might as well treat it carefully and, and, and uh, respectfully uh, as you're going through this. So if you're doing some things that you shouldn't be doing, uh, according to Bob Newhart, <laughs> there is a wonderful thing you can do. Stop it. <laughs> and, and if you are doing uh, some of these things, then um, uh, Steve Irwin would say, good on you, mate. You know, he was the, the, the crocodile hunter. And uh, Keep keep doing the good things that you're doing because they're obviously working and they're they're giving you a a building a better and better relationship with with your own self and and um, that's just going to be um, critical to health is to have the best relationship that you that you possibly can for this. Um, so. Um, Conscious mind is a decision maker and it uh, tries to understand. Please don't ever make the mistake of saying that you understand your unconscious because you don't and you can't. <laughs> There's no way. Understanding is a conscious mind process and, and that's as far as we can, we can get. There, there are way too many things going on in the unconscious for our, our unconscious doesn't have the the breadth and the depth and the speed and everything that it takes to do that. And, and, and don't say uh, something like, hey, have you got a minute? Because <laughs> it doesn't have a minute. It's got 50 trillion cells to keep up with. So respect that. Now, it'll take time to listen to you and, and you, can, you can build a, uh, an, an idea of something you want, what Robert Otto calls a dominant thought, and that's a picture um, with a very strong emotion uh, tied to it. And that's how you communicate what you want your unconscious to do for you. In addition to all these other things it's doing, it's got plenty of spare capacity. We don't know what its capacity is. Um, so, so it can do a, a lot of things. But if you just say, I want to be successful, it has no idea what you're talking about. It's like if you said, um, Karen, I could not hardly fail to disagree with you less about what you just said. And <laughs> so so it, it's just too, too complex. Um, uh, language, uh, spoken language is a, is a conscious mind uh, process. 
not an unconscious one. So learn to speak to your unconscious in raw sensory data. It's it's the actual, what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? What does it taste and smell like? You know, that now you're giving, and repetition, that's another element of a dominant thought. Because if you, you know, if you decide, I want to learn how to play the violin, and you take a lesson, well, you're not a great violinist. You you got to repeat, and because you got to put muscle memory in place, you've got to put all kind of additional information in, and that repetition is what gives your unconscious all the stuff that it needs in order to to pull this off and 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 do a good job of it. So. Um, you you um I had a golfer and um he uh, he was up on the first tee and I was out and I said, wait a minute, before you hit the ball, wh what are you thinking about right now? And he said, Well, um, there's a water hazard all the way down the left hand side of this fairway. And I said, Yes, I see that. Then so so what? And he said, Well, I'm gonna hit my ball in there. And I said, why are you going to do that? And he said, I always do. If there's any water around, that's where my ball's going. I said, so you've done that before? Oh, many, many times. You know exactly what it looks like then. Yeah, yeah. I can see the arc of my ball going right over. I even know what sound it's going to make. Bloop. You know, that's my ball going in the water. And I said, and when that happens, how do you feel about that? When I get so mad, I throw my clubs away. I'm gonna give up the game of golf. I'm never. And and you've done that many times. Oh yeah. I said, well, congratulations. You just created dominant thought, and you've taught yourself to hit the ball in the water. If there's any around, you've taught yourself how to hit the ball in there. That's that's how dominant thoughts work. Clear picture, repetition anger or strong emotion in this case it was anger here's the here's the two-edged sword about it your unconscious doesn't know the difference between what you want and what you don't want all it knows is that if you repeat a picture with a strong emotion enough times that's the signal for the unconscious to take over and do it automatically that's the foundation of a habit forming a habit that's how it that's how it knows to form a habit because you keep doing something over and over and over and it says oh i see a pattern here you've repeated that enough times that's my signal to say you want me to do that for you so you don't have to think about it anymore it's going to do it automatically that's how you drive a car scarily enough all these drivers out there are in a nice hypnotic trance <laughs> doing automatic driving because they've already gone through the learning process. I learned how to drive a car. I know how to do it now. I can get in the car. When I turn that key, that activates the driving program. Come over and come out and take over. And now I can have a conversation. I can listen to the radio. I can think about where I'm going. I can do all these things. I'm not thinking about driving that car anymore. I've long since given up having to think about that because I went through the repetition of learning and now I can do it without thinking. That's just kind of the foundation of it. So, so if you went to a concert and I said the next day, how was that concert? And you said, it was fantastic. I have no idea what the concert was like. I know a little bit about your appraisal of it, but there's not enough word. Words are the next thing to raw sensory data. That's all. That's the best we got. But there's not enough words in the world to tell me enough information so that I could experience what it was like being at that concert. It's like one of those you had to be there. There's no, there's no way to do it otherwise. I can give you a lot of descriptives, but that's not what the concert was really like. So anyway, just um, something that we we need to deal with. Um, we um, um, share future decisions, decisions about the future that you consciously make. So I, I deal with a lot of medical clients who are going in for knee replacement, for example. And um, 
I have people who, who don't say anything at all to their unconscious about it, you know. They know. They made the, um, they made the appointment months ahead, and then they know exactly when the date's going to be, and they go to the hospital, and they, they go down. And so what happens is the anesthesiologist puts the conscious mind to sleep. Unconscious doesn't go to sleep. It well, it will once, and that'll be the big one, and it won't wake up. But but the conscious mind's the one that gets put to sleep, and the unconscious is just laying there, dum de dum de dum, you know. And all of a sudden, here this guy pulls out a scalpel and cuts the whole uh, front of their knee open, and uh, peels it back, and then takes out a saw, <laughs> saws off the upper and lower leg bone. And the unconscious sit and say, "What? I'm, I'm in a I'm in a knife fight here, and I'm losing." <laughs> and, and so afterwards, it said, hey, "Did you know anything about? It? Oh yeah, yeah, I knew about that. I, why didn't you say anything? I'm out here. I'm going into shock because I, 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 nobody told me about it. So don't assume that the conscious is getting all the information." Uh, that the unconscious is getting all the information that the conscious has because it it operates differently on a different time schedule, a different scale of uh, of issues that it's dealing with, and and it really um, needs to be told, consulted with. Um, why are we doing that? You know uh, what's what's happening. So the first thing I have these patients do is plan a going away party for their own need before the surgery. And they I say, you gotta plan, you know, where are you gonna have the party? What's the decoration gonna be? What are you gonna serve? What kind of food and drink are you gonna have? I want you to write a speech that you're gonna give to your old departing knee, and I want you to give it to me so I can critique. But in that speech, I want you to make sure that you say, we are not angry with you about anything. We're giving you early retirement because you're desperately in need of relief. And we do have somebody coming in to take your place, not near as handsome as you are and beautiful and everything. In fact, it isn't gonna ever look like you. It's gonna be made out of metal and plastic and that kind of stuff. Um, but it's gonna functionally, it's gonna do the job that, that you're really not able to do anymore. And we want you to get some rest. We want you to have a nice retirement. And the first thing that happens after the surgery, welcome party for the new knee. What are you going to say to this new knee, which is never going to look like the part that left. And if you want it to be a, a, an accepted member of the team, you've got to work at, at having all these different parts that interact with it, the quad muscles, the hamstrings, you know, and, and, and uh, different uh, tendons and ligaments. And, and by the way, tell it, the best coach you can have is right over there in the other leg. That knee can tell you exactly how to perform. And, and, and um, it, you know, it, it knows it's, it's been doing this job for a long time. It's a good, it's a good coach. It's going to help you a lot. So again, personify. What, what would you do if this was a member of your team that was leaving? You'd want to recognize them if they were a, a valued member of the team and, and you'd want to welcome the replacement in, in some way, you know, let them know that they're, uh, that they're part of the team and you're glad that they are. So anyway, I, uh, I don't want to belabor a lot of the stuff that, that I'm talking about here, but I, I want you to see that if you will communicate, have a good time doing it, um, Really um, remember that we have the hypnotic medical advantage. We can talk to the unconscious mind. We know how to do that. That's our, that's our skill. That's our profession. And with that, you can change somebody's life in a very profound way and really enjoy being able to do it, too. So thank you all for having me. Uh, any questions, I'd be happy to entertain. Uh, I, I will guess it an answer if I don't know it. I can, uh, I'll make one up. <laughs> Alfred, how about if you go first? Yeah, I'd like, uh, am I coming across okay? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Uh-huh, Alfred? 
Okay. Uh, one, one question I have, when, when you start working with a client, is there like an average time when you see recovery start and when the time it takes for full recovery of whatever condition you're working with? Um, a it, year, it, two years, half year? It seems to vary. Um, I have um, a client, for example, who had um, had cancer uh, up in Canada. A uh, very wealthy guy. He used to send a plane down, pick me up in, Sar in Sarasota, fly me up, and and I would hypnotize him um, after breakfast, lunch, dinner, and before bedtime every day. And about the fourth day, we'd both be so goofy we'd have to stop, you know, and he'd he'd send me back home again. And he was getting blood tests done in Germany uh, to see how his cancer cell uh, quantity of cancer cells in his body. And we would knock them down, and then we would um, then they would build back up again, and then we'd knock them down again. He'd bring me back again about every four months on average. It was about four months. And my idea was the immune system is monitoring. It gets a problem, and it'll pop up um, to a higher level um, and uh, knock the the inflammation or the or the invasion of bacteria or whatever it is, and then it'll drop back down to monitor level. But it's possible to do something called upregulating the immune system. You can't hold it there very long because it takes a lot of extra energy, but you can actually cause the immune system to operate at a higher than its normal peak performance. And so my idea was if we can knock this down over and over and over and, and get it down to a level where the immune system can manage it, then he can go into remission. And, and in fact, that's exactly what happened. It took, in that case, it took about a year uh, for that to happen. But it, it kind of depends on the severity of the issue the person's uh, dealing with. And, and also, as you know, people's capacity to do things is quite different. Um, so some people knock it out and, you know, faster and others it's kind of slow and they forget and they, I don't know if I believe that or not. And so it, doubt will kill off if almost anything you try to do. <laughs> if there's a lot of doubt in there, it'll, it, it'll just overcome. So, so you got to keep the person really positive, really optimistic, um, you know, really hopeful and, and, um, convinced that that this is really doing doing some good so i, I wish i had a, a better answer uh three weeks two days and six hours and that, that's exactly how you go. <laughs> i have i have a friend I like who cured her own parkinson's disease she was given a parkinson's diagnosis Yes. And, uh, I, I, there, it's a convoluted way they check for Parkinson. I can't even remember how, how it all went, but you're given a medication. If it works, you have it. If it doesn't work, you don't have it. Something weird like that. And there was a finite amount of time. So in that finite amount of time, or, or the doctor gave her a finite amount of time before they were going to do this drug test. And in that finite amount of time, she did all that talking to her cells and to the Parkinson's and, and to different ways of, of working with it. She knew a little bit about it. She worked on it every day for, I think she said about 15 minutes. And in that amount of time, I think it was six weeks, she six went weeks. back and it was absolutely no sign, zero, yeah. no, no indication whatsoever. Yeah. So they didn't have to do the drug ther therapy or any of that. So yeah, I think, I believe you a hundred percent that this absolutely... Yeah. I, I am continue to be amazed at the capacity uh, of the human mind body system to recover and, and heal. Um, that has to do with these Lewy bodies and the dopamine uh, production in the brain and all this kind of stuff. I have um, a couple of protocols out in in uh, that are being tested now, people with Parkinson's to see. If, if we're on to something, and, and if we are, then um, I hope we'll go on TV and... <laughs> contact Linda Williamson. Contact my friend Linda Williamson. I'll put you two in touch. She's in Sarasota. She's a neighbor. Oh, really? Yeah. So I'll okay. put you in touch. Linda Williamson is her name. I'll get you two in, in touch with each other. Okay. And Please do. I, I would love to uh, love yeah. to have a chance to, to uh, work with her. and. Uh, 
I think and, she'll and go into that too. Let her try this try this thing out that I'm that I'm doing here. I think before it's before we let you escape, please yes. give us a direct way to contact you in case we want more information. How do we get in touch with you? Okay, uh, you can email me uh, my initials A B, and then my last name Emrich at Comcast.net. And if you will either text me or voicemail me at my phone number, if you if you just call, it'll show up uh, as spam, and I won't ever be able to talk with you. But if you voicemail me or or, uh, or uh, uh, give me a text. Um, it's 941-685-9622. And I'd love to hear from you. In, any successes you're having, any experiments you're trying, or any ideas that you have of what do you think of this approach or whatever, I'd love to co uh, collaborate with you on it because I think we're we're really in a position to do some some really uh, fantastic work and 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 some have some breakthroughs that uh, people wouldn't even guess at. Well, Art, you are doing some really fantastic work and and we want to thank you for sharing that with us tonight. We are sure. are at the end of the uh, of the hour and the train is pulling into the station. So in a minute, we're going to get every, everybody a chance to uh, to honk the whistle uh, on the way out and uh, and to give you waves of love, affection, and appreciation. So so if y'all would open up your microphones and uh, say good night and thank you to Dr. Art, we will be on our way. Thank, thank you, Art. Thank you very much. That was thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, It was lovely. Yeah. Great. Beautiful.